Hey everyone, I'm Mitch. I'm one of the pastors here at Suncrest, and you're watching another episode of Suncrest On Demand. We have our friend Jody all the way from Southern California here to continue on in a series of messages we've been calling Me and God, and I can't wait for you to hear from her. Let's get going. To use the Southern California word, I am stoked to be here. I am so stoked to be here. Um, I loved all the March Madness stuff because um, I am a huge, huge college basketball fan. Um, but I'm a little afraid to tell you who my team is because I want us to like each other. I want us to have a good relationship. But I was... Um, Raised in Kentucky. So, you know, I am a crazy Kentucky Wildcats fan. Um, But actually, they're playing right now, and I'm here with you. So this is more important. I'm really stoked stoked to be here. Um, Also, I'm excited to be here because any time I get a chance to be at a place like this, um, a church that is so kingdom-minded and so generous, um, I just want to personally say thank you. Suncrest supported Mission Church before Mission Church even had a name. Um, when it was just a dream, just an idea that we would go start this new church in this tough place. And Suncrest came behind us financially, supported us, prayed for us. And so there are people being impacted um, that you may never meet this side of heaven because of your generosity and your kingdom minuses. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you um, for the way that you give, the way that you serve, the way that you pray. Um, We are in a series right now that's called Me and God. And we're looking at some key passages as we lead up to Easter from the book of Romans, that's in the New Testament of the Bible. Um, and, and there's these three themes that we're looking at. Last week, we talked about brokenness. And if you missed last week, I'm just gonna tell you, leave right now, go watch it. I mean, it's, last week's message was so, so good about our brokenness and about the grace of God and what that means. Today, we're gonna talk about redemption um, in a passage. And then next week, we're looking at this new life, this eternal life that we get um, because of Jesus. And when Greg sent me um, my passage for this weekend, our passage for this weekend, um, which we'll get to in a minute, I got so excited because it is such good news. And I love being able to bring good news. You ever have anybody tell you, like, I've got some good news and some bad news? Like, which one do you want to hear first? Anybody want to hear the, the, the good news first? No, that you'd be a total Debbie Downer. No one wants to end on the bad news. We want to hear the bad news first, so that makes the good news really good, right? But it's so easy for us to get bombarded with bad news, surrounded by bad news. I mean, our phones are in our hands all day long. We're scrolling social media. Uh, We're looking at news apps. We're seeing rising debt and unemployment and healthcare and layoffs and gas prices and plants closing and teacher strikes and, you know, all of the things, shootings. Like, seems like no matter where we look, no matter what, you know, even news station we choose, it's just bad news and more bad news. And then it goes to a commercial and there's like some drug that's being promoted and the disclaimer for the drug is longer than the commercial for the drug, right? If you or your family member or caregiver notice agitation, hostility, depression, or changes in behavior, mood, or thinking that are not typical for you or you develop suicidal thoughts or actions, anxiety, panic, aggression, anger, mania, abnormal sensations, hallucinations, paranoia, confusion, stop taking and call your doctor right away. Also, tell your doctor if you have any history of depression or other mental health problems before taking, as these symptoms may worsen while taking. Some people can have serious skin reactions while taking. Some can become life-threatening. These can include rash, swelling, redness, peeling of the skin. Some people can have allergic reactions, too, which can become life-threatening and include swelling of the face, mouth, throat, and can cause trouble breathing. If you have these symptoms or a rash with peeling skin or blisters in your mouth, stop taking and get medical attention right away. In clinical trials, the most common side effects include... Nausea, sleep problems, constipation, gas, like it just doesn't sound good, does it? 
It sounds like really bad news, and we can get so overwhelmed by seeing and hearing and watching just bad news, our heads spin, which is why I really appreciated this segment that Jimmy Fallon does called I've Got Good News and Good News. He basically asks local news anchors to report on stories we wish were true, uh, stories that make us happy. So uh, why don't you check this out? I've got good news and good news. Vladimir Putin says he's over the whole being evil thing and is currently in the process of writing a children's book called The Happy Octopus. <laughs> There's a new iPhone app out that helps give advice to people going through a divorce, but it didn't sell well in the stores. It appears that everybody is happily married. A new study found that water slides, pizza, sunshine, friendship, shooting stars, breath mints, dance parties, and turtles are all awesome. Great news, everybody. Ghosts cannot hurt you. Nobody's ever been hurt by a ghost. Ghosts are scary. Nobody's saying they're not. But there is not one reported case of death caused by a ghost. This just ends. Stress, spelled backwards, is desserts. <laughs> this just in, your favorite sports team can now hear your suggestions through the television, and they love the helpful advice. So the next time you yell, how about playing some real defense? You can expect to see some real defense. Don't you feel better just getting some good news um, and some good news? Well, today I've got some good news. In fact, the word gospel comes from this old English word, um, Godspell, which means good news. It's literally what the word gospel means. So maybe you've heard that term, you know, gospel choir or gospel preacher, or how the first four books in the New Testament, the biographies of Jesus' life are called the gospels. That's just people singing about and writing about and talking about the good news of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that means for us. This good news, this is the gospel, and this, this is our passage today. This is such good news. Romans 5, 6 through 8. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is really good news. And today I'd like for us to think um, not only about these verses theologically or theoretically or hypothetically, I'd love for each of us to consider them personally. Because the gospel is not only the good news, it is really good news for someone like you, for someone like me. See, the very beginning of this passage, it, it talks about this, right? No one is exempt. This is for everyone. No one's gone too far. That he pursues someone like you. Maybe you don't even know why you showed up today. Or why you logged on, this really isn't your thing, you know? Your life's kind of a mess. You thought the roof might cave in. It didn't, you're all good. But you don't even know why you're really here. God does. He is pursuing you. He's after you. He's after your heart. And he will meet you right where you're at. That's our Jesus. That verse says when we are powerless, and ungodly, and sinners. Like when we're bruised and we're battered and we're hopeless. When we're guilty and ashamed, he moves towards us, he pursues us. And he will meet you right in the middle of your mess. No matter how messy it is. He's met me in my, the middle of my mess so many times I can't even count. And I'm so grateful to see a picture the truth of a savior who doesn't say, you gotta get yourself cleaned up first before you can come to me. Or that I don't have to become the best version of myself before God will meet with me. No, quite the opposite is true. The place he most desires to meet with us is in our brokenness. He came for it. He lives for it. He died for it. To meet us in those places, the, the overwhelmed places, the hopeless places, the shameful places, the hurtful places, the ungodly, powerless, sinful places. He will meet us right there because he is a God who longs to rescue 
and restore our relationship with him. And maybe you don't know that about God. Maybe you have thought that if you came to him, he would be angry with you or maybe disgusted by you or at least frustrated that you're back in that same place again. Maybe you've always thought of God as someone who wanted to condemn you or bust you, but this is not the God that Jesus shows us. You need to know today we have a savior who's willing to get messy. He is bold enough to deal with your dysfunction. He is fearless enough to walk with you through an addiction. He's heroic enough to lift you up out of whatever kind of abuse you may have known. He pursues someone like you. And he's after you and after your heart because he wants you to experience his love and his friendship and his light and his peace and his freedom and his forgiveness and his guidance. And maybe you're just thinking, not me. Maybe you think it's not for you. Other people maybe, but you couldn't really get in with God. Like not with what you've done. But all you have to do is look at the life of Jesus. Because I've lived that way for a while too, that maybe God could forgive me, but I just really couldn't get in with him. Not really have a relationship with him, not with what I've done. And I've wanted to be in to be in the in crowd, in the loop, in the know, among the proud, not left out, but to be allowed to be in. I've wanted to be in. To wear clothes that are in style, a trendsetter and versatile, just the right cut and a perfect smile. I have wanted to be in. To be looked at as someone who has much. All the in music on my Spotify plus, on the latest and greatest stuff and such. I've wanted to be in but I have felt aggravated, frustrated, unappreciated, slated as someone who is underrated, unimportant, unknown, unseen, average, mediocre, routine, beneath, below, beyond a chance, inconsequential, insignificant. But Jesus, he met people like me, took notice of a blind man and made him see saw a locked up kid and set him free, told little Zacchaeus to get out of the tree. He felt it when a desperate woman touched his cloak, kneeled beside a dead girl and up she woke, hung out with the down and out and broke, offered hope to the forgotten, which is the words he spoke. He touched a man with leprosy, who others would mock, touched the mouths of the mute and at once they could talk, forgave a woman at a well who was the laughing stock, came to be a shepherd to a wandering flock, in the company of sinners. That's where he would eat. Defended an adulterer, made her accusers retreat, made followers out of men who were crooked cheats. Let the tears of a prostitute anoint his feet. And suddenly, dramatically, undeniably, they were in, in his story, in his truth, in his grace, in his purpose, in his eyes, someone great, and I have wanted to be in. And since the day I met with him, he took all that I had been, all my fear, my shame, my sin, and changed my life by letting me in. By the grace of God, I get in. And by the grace of God, you get in too. This is really good news. He came for someone like you. He's pursuing someone like you. He also can redeem someone like you. I looked up that word this week in the old English dictionary because, you know, redeem can kind of be a churchy word, you know, but just check these first four definitions that popped up. To make something acceptable, to restore reputation, atone for human sin, to buy something back. And Jesus can redeem any life. This is what he died for. He went to the cross to atone for human sin, to purchase our freedom, to buy back our wasted years, to restore our reputations and make us acceptable to God. He did that. He does that. He pursues us so that he can redeem us. 
And with the Lord, there is redemption like no other. Psalm 137 tells us, O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. Every time I think of that verse, I think of Dumb and Dumber, um, when Harry said to Lord after he traded the shag and wagon in, like, just when I think you couldn't be any dumber, you do something like this and totally redeem yourself. Listen, you can't totally redeem yourself. I can't totally redeem myself. Jesus can totally redeem any life. It's not partial. It's not halfway. It's not to make you feel a little less guilty or a little better about yourself. It's not a cleaned up version of you. It is full redemption paid for by his blood. You have been bought back. You see, here's the really bad news. Everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. That's that's all of us. Good news Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous, and he did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin, and people are made right with God. We get redeemed when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. That's bad news. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's good news. For no one, Romans 3.20, can be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are, how much we've messed up, how powerless we are, how much we've gone astray. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as promised in the writings of Moses and the promise prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true, get this, for everyone who believes no matter who we are. That's really good news. Here's some good news and some good news. Colossians 1, 13 and 14, for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased, he bought it back, he purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for God made Christ, who had never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right through Christ. Jesus is in the business of redemption. He pursues us to redeem us. And then this really cool thing happens. Not only are we made right with God, and we get this full redemption, God continues to redeem all of our stuff and all of our junk to like pour hope into other people. Like it's a miracle, this redemption. It doesn't matter what you've done. He can recycle all of our mistakes, our pain, our failures, and he buys them back for his good purposes. If we let him, he transforms our our test into a testimony, our mess into a message, our misery into a ministry. I love how artist Lecrae puts it. He says, if we can be honest about our scars, we can show other people that wounds can heal. I mean, think about it. Who better to help someone struggling with a drug or alcohol addiction than someone who's been there and has experienced freedom, has been redeemed, Who better to help someone through an eating disorder or the pain of abuse or unfaithfulness or bankruptcy or the loss of a child or chemotherapy or a divorce than someone who's been there and is allowing God to redeem it all for his purposes? Maybe you're here today and you've experienced that. You've experienced being in one of those moments where you're like, whoa, I think I was like supposed to be there. I was supposed to be on that flight. I was supposed to be in that restaurant. I was supposed to be at that PTA meeting or on that field or in that locker room. It it was supposed to be me. You know, you knew, you had one of those moments where you knew it had to be you because of what you've been through, like a divine appointment. This is an extension of his redemption. And if we are willing, he can use it all to pour hope into other people. Jenny Allen puts it this way, out of our pain, 
we heal. Out of our bondage, we set free. And the messiest waste of our lives becomes the most fertile soil for God to just grow something beautiful. Isn't that the way of our reclaiming God, that the messiest waste of our lives becomes the most fertile soil for what he wants to do in us and through us? It's good news. He pursues someone like you because he wants to redeem someone like you. And his motive, it's because he loves someone like you. This is God's motivation. It is out of his great love for you. God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And we don't have a God who says, I love you, but good luck, you know, good luck. No, we have a God who demonstrates his own love for us in this. He proves it. While we were still sinners, ungodly, powerless, Christ died for us. This is why he pursues us. This is why he redeems us. This is why he rescues us. This is why he transforms us. It's because he loves us. He loves us. And this love, this love of God, it's for everyone. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, that's really good news, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And I have had the privilege in my life of seeing a lot of whoever's come to know Jesus. And man, it never gets old. When I was 12 years old, my family, um, I'm a pastor's kid. I was 12 years old, my family moved from rural Kentucky, um, a town of like 7,000 people to Las Vegas. So slight culture shock, right? And my dad planted a church there in Vegas, and uh, we, we met at a local YMCA. We set up all the chairs. My dad preached in front of a mural of like a gymnast in a pose, and we had babies in racquetball rooms. It was like a whole thing. But looking back on those teenage years in Vegas and being a part of that church plant, that's when I came to realize and understand that the gospel, the good news, is for alcoholics and exotic dancers and for high rollers and for the guy digging through his car cushions for another quarter. I saw the good news come alive to wine goddesses at Caesar's Palace, runaways camping in cheap motels, dealers, bangers, and addicts. When I was 17, I went on a journey of my own, just running away from God and his pursuit of me, coming back to him. And I discovered that the gospel, the good news, is for the people-pleasing, conning, impure, cheat, deceitful, materialistic rebel. And I am so grateful. When I was 19, I had the opportunity to live in Haiti for a year. It was a year that changed my life. And I discovered that the good news of Jesus Christ is for the poor, for the forgotten, for the illiterate, for uneducated. It's for the oppressed, for the enslaved, for witch doctors, and for people dying I saw the gospel bring people to their feet clapping outside of mud huts. I learned it was for children and orphans, for people starving literally and starving for hope. In our 20s, my husband and I had the privilege of working at just some incredible churches in the South and in the Midwest. And I learned that the gospel is for frat boys and girls gone wild and for the kid that's been showing up to Sunday school since he could breathe. I learned that it's for firemen and farmers and truck drivers and stockbrokers and stay-at-home moms, for rednecks and seminary graduates, for people with secret lives and stagnant faith, for politicians, factory workers, and self-righteous church leaders, for families pretending to have it all together and families falling apart. So when we planted Mission 12 years ago now, I thought I'd seen it all. I was praying do it again, God, like do it here. And little did I know that God would break through every box I put the good news in. And I have just been blown away. 
I've stood now at the beach or someone's backyard swimming pool or in rooms like this, watching people surrender their lives to Jesus Christ and see his pursuit of them, see the redemption, see the transformation because of his crazy love for them. I think of Deanna. Deanna was a prostitute turned porn star. She was an addict. Deanna met Jesus. She went to get well at a ministry called Refuge for Women. Her life has been so transformed by Jesus. She ended up getting her master's in spiritual formation, and now she's the director of the Refuge for Women that she was sent to. She's married now with two little twin girls. And every time I'm around Deanna, I'm reminded, oh yeah, Jesus doesn't make people better. Jesus makes people new. Her life's completely changed. I think about Tony. Tony, so active in his addiction when I met him, he actually coached our daughters in soccer, grieving the loss of his brother who was murdered through gang violence, just lost. Today, Tony's got three and a half years clean. He carries a color-coded Bible everywhere he goes. He's baptizing people in service. We like, he's so evangelistic. It's like, we need to put a box on our card. Like, how did you hear about mission? We need a box for Tony because Tony tells so many people about Jesus. I've watched homeless friends come up out of that water. Terminally ill, victims of rape, former inmates, hell's angel bikers, people counting days clean. And over and over again, God's like, oh, you think you've seen it all? We're just getting started. Because who is the good news for? You can answer. Everyone. Everyone. Anyone. And certainly for someone like you. And maybe today is the day for you to believe and receive what Jesus Christ has done for you and accept the good news that he redeems and we get new life and it's because he loves you. And if that's you, and maybe you even wanna go public with that decision through baptism, through that surrender, text the number, talk to somebody. Don't leave without doing one of those things because that will be the best decision you will ever make. It's not the end of a journey where like you get your life all cleaned up and then you get baptized. It's the beginning of a journey saying, I am powerless, ungodly sinner and I need a fresh start. I need a new leader. I need to surrender. And I believe Jesus Christ is my savior. If that's you, man, I know this is a community of people that would be cheering you on. Maybe for others of us today, We've been following Jesus for a long time and it's just good to be reminded how he chased us down, how he pursued us, all that he's redeemed in us. And to just be reminded that, oh yeah, it's because he loves us so much and that nothing is impossible for him. We've never locked eyes with another person that God doesn't deeply love and care about. So let's extend the hope that we've received. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the power that at just the right time, while we were still sinners, we were still powerless, you died for us. You came for us. And I thank you for the truth that you still come for us. You still chase us down. You still meet us where we're at. You still redeem. God, will we even open ourselves up in this moment to allow you to redeem, continue to redeem things in our life, to pour hope into others? And Lord, maybe more than anything today, I pray that we would leave here today, even as Greg said at the beginning, knowing we are loved. We're loved by you. And you've proven it. And you've demonstrated it. And we are grateful people. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Easter is right around the corner and we want to celebrate with you. So you can find all the details about celebrating Easter at Suncrest at suncrest.org forward slash Easter or by downloading the Suncrest app. We're going to have an amazing message, awesome music, great stories, ways for you to make a difference in our community, and so much more. In fact, the more includes things like kids' classrooms for kids fifth grade and younger, and it is amazing experiences for them. But here's the deal. 
classrooms and spaces in those environments fill up fast. So parents, if you're bringing your kids, come early so that you can make sure your kids get a great seat in Suncrest Kids. Now, I want you to participate in this, but more importantly, I want you to invite someone to join you if you're gonna come and experience Easter at Suncrest. You can find digital invites all over our social media and on our website. I hope you'll see you as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and the change that comes from following him together. Every week, we pause everything we do to focus on the love of Jesus during a time of communion. It's where those of us who follow Jesus take bread and juice, but online and on demand, go ahead and find whatever food and drink you have readily available to you. We eat and drink to remember his body broken and his blood poured out so that we might know and see what real love and life could look like. I want to invite you to reflect on that 
as we take a time together. If you're watching this and you wouldn't define yourself as someone who follows Jesus, I'm really glad you're watching because Suncrest is a great environment. It's a safe environment to wrestle with your questions about Jesus and faith and what it would look like to follow him. I'm going to put a timer, some scripture on the screens here shortly, and I want you to pause and reflect on what you've heard and be open to the idea that God is trying to get your attention right here, right now. Thanks for tuning into this episode. If you liked it, hit the like button. If you want to see more content like this from Suncrest Church, hit subscribe on YouTube. And if you know someone who needs to hear this or you want to use this as an invite to Easter at Suncrest, hit the share button. We'll see you next week as we celebrate Easter. And I hope that you experience change that only comes from following Jesus. Bye now.